In the lead up to today, I found my thoughts looping back to various points where the journey that ends tonight could be, have been said to have begun. The more I thought about it, the various life arcs and policy arcs that produced, fueled, and at times confounded this journey proliferated and intersected in my mind like so many crazy rainbows. And while the book I have here is my pot of gold, only intellectually speaking, of course, academic books do not make money, the indigenous policy arcs of recent times are generating violent storms, especially in remote areas of Western Australia and South Australia, with no rainbows in sight. In this lecture, I'll trace the beginnings and possible endings of some of these personal and policy arcs. I will draw partly on some of my recent work on the 20th century history of biological research in indigenous communities. This work has, has had me delving into the archives to understand the emergence of Indigenous studies in the 1960s and its relationship to Indigenous policy. It's also provided another way to explain the anthropological observations I make in the book. So rather than just take you through the main arguments of the book, I don't want to spoil the reading experience for you, <laughs> I'll also share some of my recent thoughts. I became interested in Aboriginal justice as a university student, angry that the high standard of living that most Australians enjoyed was built on the denial of Indigenous sovereignty and the continued suffering of an impoverished minority. The end of the Hawke Keating era in 1996 saw Howard make deep funding cuts across the public sector, including Indigenous affairs, but this did not dampen the enthusiasm of many Australians for the reconciliation movement that Keating had started. At Melbourne Uni, I helped to start an Indigenous solidarity group and arranged to do some of my medical training at Utopia, a remote community northeast of Alice Springs. When I finished my medical and arts degrees at the age of 25, I brought my first car, an old Toyota 4Runner, and drove across the country to begin my internship at the Royal Darwin Hospital. I arrived in Darwin between Christmas and New Year's Eve. Humidity was at its annual peak and for three days I felt I was in a fog, unable to think of anything but the oppressive heat. I soon began work at the Royal Darwin Hospital, where around 70% of the patients were Aboriginal. The air-conditioned hospital was too cold for them, and the concrete area outside the main doors buzzed with life, with young kids running around and family groups sitting and talking in various Aboriginal languages, eating chips from the cafe and passing around cigarettes, with tubes and bags of bodily fluids protruding from hospital gowns. It seemed to me that more should be done to prevent the endless cycle of sick Indigenous people through the health system and back to the social conditions that had made them sick and would do so again. It was not long before I became interested in the Public Health Research Institute next door to the hospital, a place where dedicated non-Indigenous researchers worked alongside Indigenous people to find better ways to prevent disease. I attended their weekly meetings and eagerly listened to tales of community health promotion projects where researchers supported local people to identify and address their own health priorities. Their presentations were littered with happy snaps of cultural connection. Indigenous people cheerfully participating in research, kids playing up for the camera, island beaches, lily-strewn billabongs and damper roasting on the fire. In my personal journey of methodically applying myself to what I thought to be the most important cause in the most effective way, public health research seemed the next logical step. Finally, it was me flying on a tiny plane to a remote community, shyly meeting the council chairman and thanking him for letting me visit explaining our, projects, our project to Aboriginal health workers with the aid of brightly coloured flip charts and tentatively trying out the Aboriginal languages phrases I had learnt. After a few years of intermittent remote community work, combined with long stretches in front of a computer in town, translating the work into quantifiable outcomes and lists of remaining challenges, I felt a growing sense of unease. The rhetoric of the Institute promised that adopting the principles of self-determination and Indigenous control would lead to effective public health measures that would close the gap in health outcomes. 
But in practice, all the measures to increase Indigenous control seem to have the greatest effect on white researchers, making them wary of what they did and said. I realised that what I had learnt in my time at the Institute was more about the moral politics of race and identity than improving Indigenous health. I began to form an answer to that fundamental question I sometimes ask myself in times of frustration, a question that haunts many of the white anti-racists described in this book. What the hell are we white people actually doing here? As my research progressed, I began to express this differently. What happens when a group of intelligent, well-meaning people, aware of the past and supported by the state, attempt to help Indigenous people without harming them? Trapped in the gap is my attempt at an answer. While I won't spell out my answers in any detail here, as I said, suffice to say I found that the attempts of white anti-racists to help without harming were racked with ambivalence. Those who seek to close the gap experience two equal and opposing fears. First, they understand that improving Indigenous health requires systemic change and they question their ability to overcome the institutional racism of post-settler society. While the gap remains as an organic barometer of oppression, they fear they are doing too little. At the same time, they fear they are doing too much. Encounters with radically different Indigenous ways of life leave white anti-racists concerned that their efforts to improve the health and social status of Indigenous people might be furthering Western norms at the cost of Indigenous difference. If the gap is due to the, essential, to the ways of life essential to cultural survival, it follows that erasing the gap erases Indigenous culture. Despite the post-colonial mantra of community control, white anti-racists worry that their labours will be judged as indistinguishable from those of racist bureaucrats and missionaries of the past. This book explains these fears as the product of a long-standing tension between equality and difference. For as long as white people, as long as, long as white Australians have sought to interfe intervene in Indigenous lives, some of those missionaries, anthropologists, professionals or bureaucrats have worried that the goal of improvement, whether it be civilization, salvation, citizenship, good health or education, runs counter to the goal of maintaining Indigenous difference. Each era of Indigenous policy attempts to manage the tensions between equality and difference in its own way, forming the interconnecting and conflicting policy arcs I will sketch out. In what is known as the self-determination era, which began in the early 1970s and may or may not be currently ending, Equality is understood through statistics, statistical equality. We produce a myriad of statistics about those things we consider to constitute a good life, like good health, stable employment, and one functional clean house per nuclear family. And we strive to equalise the outcomes for non-Indigenous and Indigenous people to make the lines on the graph converge. The gap forms its own arc in my life and in Indigenous policy. As I wrote up the PhD that forms the empirical backbone of this book back in 2006, the very first Close the Gap campaign was launched by Cathy Freeman and Ian Thorpe for the international NGO Oxfam. The first time I saw the logo, it crystallised everything I had been writing about equality in the self-determination era. Since then, Close the Gap has become the mantra of Indigenous policy across the nation, and measurable indicators, sometimes even culturally based ones, have mushroomed an overflow from statistical collections, standing committee terms of reference, performance frameworks, and NGO report cards. The beginning of the gap as a policy framework, as a policy arc, coincided with a new arc in my life, I wrote my PhD frantically, with frequent interruptions and gaps, as I struggled to adjust to the competing demands of academic motherhood, demands I could never have met without the incredible support of my husband, Ian Paradis, 
I began to hone that cruel but absolutely necessary skill of pretending not to hear my child in order to finish writing my sentence. And this is my daughter Maya at seven months. She was a very mobile baby, as was her younger sister Eden. And I commit the faux pas of bringing the private into a public lecture because so many early career researchers work under these emotional relations of production and it is, to put it mildly, a challenge. Nine years later, academic motherhood is still highly demanding, but I get a flush of ironic joy, a version of what we call in Yiddish, nachas, when my girls now pretend not to hear me in order to finish reading and writing their own sentences. Back then, in the gaps between feeding and cooking and washing and not enough sleeping, I wrote about the politics of closing statistical gaps. Here again is this characteristic image of statistical equality. In this case, child mortality in the Northern Territory from the late 1960s when vital statistics were first collected until the turn of the century. And I use this with um, permission from John Condon. After dramatic improvements into the early 1980s, the lines remain frustratingly parallel decreasing at roughly the same rate. As the gap remains the same, the proportional difference increases. By a quirk of simple arithmetic, if Indigenous and non-Indigenous rates improve by the same rate, the ratio of Indigenous to non-Indigenous is amplified. Unless Indigenous health can be improved faster than the health of the general population, efforts to close the gap will be fruitless. But the latest Overcoming Indis Indigenous Disadvantage report released last November shows that the narrative arc of the gap may be coming to an end, or at least beginning to. After seven Productivity Commission reports on Indigenous disadvantage that are full of measuring gaps and assessing progress in shrinking them, this eighth report explicitly disavows the gap. At the top of page two of the um, overview booklet, we are told, the key consideration was change over time in outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, not the gap to non-Indigenous Australians. It is important to acknowledge improvements in outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, even if improvements for non-Indigenous Australians mean that the gap has not narrowed. Now, this is a startling shift. The very purpose of this report is to report against the COAG tar targets uh, set in 2009, and each of these six targets aims to either halve or to eliminate, you guessed it, a gap. So how can they dispense with the concept? The report deals with this significant semantic problem by stating the improvements or lack thereof for Indigenous people for each target area, education, employment, income, and then stating the change over the same period for non-Indigenous Australians, but without directly comparing the two. Now, I don't know if this approach will become the norm or what Indigenous policy will look like without the gap or whether this is just a quirk of someone at the Productivity Commission. But I appreciate the ironic symmetry that as the culmination of my sustained critique of the gap is finally published, the gap itself may be in retreat. The possible end of the gap as a policy tool and object of analysis pales into significance, into insignificance in a time when we are facing the end of some remote communities. Remote Aboriginal Australia, at least in Western and South Australia, is facing an unprecedented crisis, which is saying a lot for a population that seems perpetually associated with crisis. This time, the very existence of communities is threatened as the federal government withdraws financial support for outstations, creating a funding chasm that the two state governments have decisively stepped away from. The beginning of this ending could be dated to 2005, when Howard, fresh from abolishing ATSIC, announced the first mutual obligation policy. It concerned Mullen, a small community 300 kilometres south of Halls Creek and west of the former mission community of Balgo, 
And this is an image of Mullen that was widely circulated at the time. Mullen was established as part of the outstation movement, a hallmark of the self-determination era in the late 1970s. The outstation movement provided government support to Aboriginal people to move away from the larger remote settlements, former missions or government settlements, to establish small settlements on traditional country that in many cases had passed into Aboriginal ownership through land, land rights legislation or other means. Mullen is a typical story formed by Walmajari people moving west from Balgo Mission to a pastoral station that had been transferred to the Aboriginal Land Trust in 1978. As the site of Howard's first shared responsibility agreement, Mullen was thrust into the national spotlight late in 2004. Under the agreement, residents would receive a petrol bowser in return for making sure children attended school regularly and washed their faces twice a day to reduce the high incidence of trachoma, an eye infection that causes blindness. At the time, commentators and scholars wondered if this was the beginning of the end of the self-determination era, with the then uh, Indigenous Affairs Minister Amanda Vanstone coining the term cultural museums to describe outstations and declaring that some would not be viable over the longer term. The recent announcement that Colin Barnett planned to withdraw funding to 150 outstations in Western Australia from July this year may close the policy arc begun in the early 1970s. Mullen, with a population of 114 at the 2006 census, may be in danger of making the list of communities destined to have their water and power supply cut from July 1st. If it is, this would cement Mullen's historical significance as a site of fluctuating policy experimentation. If the self-determination era is indeed completing its four decade policy arc, what is replacing it? This question has been asked by many in recent years and a common answer draws on the current policy buzzwords, responsibility and partnerships influenced most of all by Noel Pearson. Others have warned that the policies of recent years are, are a return to assimilation and this is a classic image from A.O. Neville. I agree or disagree that it's a return to assimilation, depending on what you mean by assimilation. To most progressive anti-racist Australians, assimilation means stealing so-called half-caste children and placing them in often abusive institutions, breeding out the colour, the micromanagement of every aspect of Aboriginal lives and stolen wages, missions forbidding people to speak their own languages. Now, it, it's critical that these cruel and tragic features of 20th century Australian history are remembered and their victims are compensated. However, most historians agree that they were not the core logic or practice of the assimilation era. Contrary to how it is often characterised, as it developed from the 1930s to the 1960s, assimilation was above all a progressive policy of inclusion. So while the image of whitening across the generations is the most iconic one associated with the assimilation era, this somewhat less famous image may better represent assimilation. It is the cover of a 1961 edition of a series of booklets published by the Department of Territories to support the civil component of assimilation. They aimed to convince non-Indigenous Australians to accept Aboriginal people as full citizens and amounted to a sustained anti-racism campaign, I think one of Australia's first. Reading this image for the meaning of assimilation, it is difficult to conclude that assimilation was primarily about making Indigenous people into white people. This model of an assimilated Aboriginal man on the cover is an Aboriginal mechanic equal to but not the same as his white colleague. As explained by the Secretary of the Department of Territories in 1961, assimilated Aboriginal people should retain their culture except those aspects that interfered with their ability to work, such as a tendency to go walkabout or extravagant sharing of possessions, 
The start of this policy arc could be identified, this policy arc of assimilation, could be identified in the Aboriginal activist movements of the 1930s that demanded citizenship and equality for Aboriginal people. It could be the 1944 book Citizenship for Aborigines, where anthropologist A.P. Elkin set out a comprehensive program for assimilation and equal rights. While these are a critical precedents, for practical policy beginnings, we could look to the 1948 Conference of Commonwealth and State Aboriginal Authorities that resolved to provide education to Aboriginal settlements in the Northern Territory. But for a systematic statement of assimilation policy and its implications, we must move forward to the year this booklet was produced, 1961. At the Native Welfare Conference held on Australia Day that year, Paul Hasluck, Commonwealth Minister for Territories since 1951, successfully brokered an agreement with the states to comprehensively define assimilation and, po and its policy implications for the first time. Assimilation meant that all Aborigines and part Aborigines are expected eventually to attain the same manner of living as other Australians and to live as members of a single Australian community, enjoying the same rights and privileges, accepting the same responsibilities, observing the same customs and influenced by the same beliefs, hopes and loyalties as other Australians. Now, there is plenty to critique in this definition and in the years following, official definitions shifted to value more the continuation of Indigenous customs and beliefs before eventually being abandoned as a policy in the 1970s. But what I want, want to emphasise here are the methods of advancing the policy that formed the next part of the conference statement. Extension, where applicable, of government settlement work to encourage nomadic and, and semi-nomadic natives to adopt a more settled way of life and to make health services, better standards of housing and nutrition, schooling, vocational training and occupation available to them and their children as a first stage towards their assimilation. Although some of these services had been provided through missions for decades and Hasluck had increased funding for missions and government settlements through the 1950s, here for the first time nat national and state governments were admitting their responsibility for providing services to all Aboriginal people with the aim of attaining the same manner of living as other Australians. It is to this point in 1961 that the policy arc of the gap can most clearly be traced. This policy arc has continued through various buzzwords and catchphrases, integration, advancement, closing the gap, shared responsibility, the NT intervention, stronger futures, advancement again, and now empowered communities. It is what I explore in the book as as the desire to achieve statistical equality for Indigenous Australians. Remedialism. This vision sees the Indigenous population climb the ladder of opportunity, accumulating social capital until they eventually become middle class, or at least some of them. It is a policy arc that has steadily gained momentum and sophistication over the last 50 years and is advocated by many Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike. While the self-determination era is usually depicted as the antithesis of assimilation, if we consider this longer policy arc of remedialism, it is the continuities that come to the fore. The major legacies of the self-determination era, according to Tim Rouse, are one, the statistical archive of Indigenous disadvantage, and two, the thousands of incorporated Aboriginal organisations and I think these have both aided efforts at equality, at closing gaps and climbing ladders by providing methods to measure them and Aboriginal organisations to deliver government funded gap closing services. So notwithstanding my earlier observation about the possible end of the gap, I don't see an end in sight for this policy arc. A second, shorter policy arc overlays the longer policy arc of remedialism. This shorter arc of difference 
that began in the early 1970s um, is the one that may be in its final days. This arc is contained within the era that was heralded by Whitlam's pledge to restore to the Aboriginal people of Australia their lost power of self-determination. My contention is that some aspects of the self-determination era served the policy arc of equality, like those I mentioned before, while other aspects served the conflicting policy arc of difference. The self-determination era encompassed two aspects that supported Indigenous difference to an unprecedented degree, land rights and the outstation movement. In combination, these policies supported the maintenance of priorities and modes of life radically different to those of the Western mainstream. Particularly in the remote northern and central regions of the country, the 1970s saw a renaissance of subsistence activities and ceremonial life. In this period, the policy arc of, of, of equality and the policy arc of difference overlapped and were in tension. For while arguments have been made that outstation living may be the key to closing the gap, for example, that outstation residents have better health, the bulk of evidence clearly contradicts this. As John Altman, perhaps the most prominent outstation advocate, observed in the wake of the NT intervention, the big picture is that equality of socioeconomic status will not occur if people continue to live on their land in remote Australia if they retain distinct cultural practices and priorities, and if they resist or do not desire to move up the settlement hierarchy to towns and cities. The ambivalences and ambiguities I found among the white anti-racists described in this book can be explained by the collision of these two policy arcs. Supporting radical Indigenous difference on outstations while simultaneously trying to close gaps of, di of disadvantage brings the tension between difference and equality to breaking point. But I've not answered the question that I posed. What is replacing the self-determination era and what does it mean for white anti-racists? For the sake of argument, let us accept that the current moment is indeed the end of the policy arc that began in the early 70s and supported or allowed or maybe just flirted with the perpetuation of non-Western life worlds. The end of this relatively shorter policy arc of difference may relieve the tension of difference and equality. The goal of equality, unperturbed by radical difference, is imagined as a stepwise transition from unemployment to unskilled jobs to skilled jobs to home ownership, with some reaching the middle class perhaps over two generations. If those different ways of life that stand in the way of a Protestant work ethic, a tendency to go walkabout or extravagant sharing of possessions, if they are lost on the way, then so be it. In my ongoing contact with people that work in Indigenous affairs, my sense is that this unadulterated remedialism, this quest for equality without ambivalence, is on the rise. If this is the case, the question of whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is critical, but a much longer conversation than I can broach here. But I will end by troubling my own narrative of the end of the policy arc of difference by saying that even those who seem untroubled by difference may always be haunted by it. I illustrate this with an article in the latest issue of The Monthly, a publication aimed at a progressive anti-racist audience and that more or less reflects their views, their concerns. This article is about Aboriginal art, which is itself a component of the policy arc of difference and which it is feared is in permanent economic decline as the so-called first contact artists who grew up beyond the reach of white people and institutions are almost gone and it is their art that is most highly prized. The article is about the late artist known as Sally Gabori, a Kaodild woman from Mornington Island who became an international sensation after taking up painting in the early 1980s until her death two months ago. And this is a detail from her 2008 work, Dibby Dibby Country, 
A story is told about the National Gallery of Australia's second Indigenous art triennial in 2012, when Gabori's work was heavily represented. As another artist gave a talk, Gabori sat at the back of the crowd, close to some of her paintings. Then, without warning, she rose from her wheelchair and turned um, and began to silently dance. Some in the crowd realised what was happening and turned to marvel and record the unscheduled performance. The article concludes, no one quite knew what they were witnessing, but everyone, it seems, believed. What did they believe in, those who watched Sally Gabori dance? And those of us who worry about radical difference and its possible end, what do we believe in? Do we believe that distinct ways of knowing and being must be preserved, whether in the name of human rights, Indigenous cultural rights, restorative justice, national heritage or global diversity? Will we need the knowledge that propelled Sally Gabori out of her wheelchair to save our skins in this anthropogenic age of extinction? Or do we believe that globalising change is inevitable, that Indigenous people should participate in it like the rest of us, and protecting them from the real economy is counterproductive? Do we reject the dichotomy between development and cultural identity and have faith that Indigenous people will be and, are or and already are global citizens in their own distinct way? It may be frustrating for some that Trapped in the Gap does not tell people what to believe. Instead, it provides a conceptual framework to map the fraught terrain of Indigenous affairs inviting readers to trace their own arcs of understanding and belief. And as the arc of this lecture comes to a close, I'd like to end by expressing my gratitude to Feti, to Lee and to Brenda for recognising what I had done and what I could do at Deakin. I'd like to thank all the mentors who have supported me in recent years, many of whom are acknowledged in the book, but especially John Cash or Williamson, Warwick Anderson, Gassan Haj, Monica Minigal, Minigal, Chris Healy, Deidre Coleman, and last but not at all least, Martha McIntyre, who support, supervised my honours research 16 years ago and saw my potential as an academic years before I thought of becoming one, and who nominated me for the Paul Burke Award. And finally, I'd like to thank my family for all their support, love and tolerance. Thank you.